Institute, including volunteering at programs such as this one and networking with our special guests. If you are a student and would like to join, please email us at dolesab at ku.edu or speak with a student worker after the program. A video of today's program will be available on our YouTube channel, and you can also access videos of past programs by visiting our YouTube channel. A loop hearing system is available to use if you have a T-coil hearing aid, and we also have a limited number of listening devices. If you have questions about the loop system, or if at any time during the program you have difficulty hearing, please alert one of our staff members. After the program, we will have some time for the audience to ask questions, and if you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you are able and ask just one brief question. If you are part of our virtual audience, you may submit your questions at dolequestions at ku.edu. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics. Please phrase your questions with this in mind. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones and now, please join me in welcoming Director Audrey Coleman. Hello, good evening. Thank you so much, Charlie, for that wonderful introduction. It is hard for me to contain my excitement about this program. As many of you, all of you, are probably well aware, this is our 20th anniversary year here at the Dole Institute, and what better way to honor what we do here at the Dole Institute than invite our former Student Advisory Board members to come back here and share their outstanding expertise on the Constitution and constitutional law. And I, our moderator, uh, Dr. Barbara Ballard here, uh, had this fantastic idea, and we're just so pleased that you've chosen to be with us this evening for that occasion. Thank you so much to our FODI friend, friend of the Dole Institute, Mark Johnson, for making our Constitution Day programming possible. Um, this year is just going to—it's outstanding every year. This year is just going to be so wonderful. I've heard so many good comments out there uh, of people really anticipating this program. So before I turn it over to Barbara, I want to be sure and give you all a heads up on a couple of programs. Uh, while I have you, we have a program coming up on October 10th that the Student Advisory Board is hosting. It's a very esoteric. Um, niche topic, and I really encourage you all to give it a try. Uh, it's called Taylor Swift, A Conversation on Influence and Advocacy, <clears throat> especially out here in the Midwest. I mean, we just have to get on board. So please join us October 10th, uh, Tuesday at 7 p.m. Uh, Ali Hagar, our Student Advisory Board Coordinator, will be moderating that discussion. Uh, on October 19th at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, we'll welcome back uh, First Lady Scholars Diana Carlin and Myra Gut Diana Carlin and Myra Guten for 10 defining moments in the history of the American First Lady from 1900 to 2023. And then again, uh, most folks have seen the announcement, but at the end of October on the 24th at 7 p.m., we're going to welcome Jerry Seib, uh, former Washington editor of the Wall Street Journal, back to the Dole Institute to visit with his friends, Celinda Lake and Ed Goaz, a Democrat and Republican pollsters uh, who published the Battleground Poll from Georgetown's Institute of Politics and Public Service for decades. They'll be discussing their new book, A Question of Respect. Uh, this Dole Institute community is so, so special. It's community members like you all and these students that we have up here uh, on the stage tonight. So um, this is a special night. And Barbara, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. <laughs> and certainly good evening. And I want to thank you all for turning out this evening. I think you're in for a real treat. Speech, guns, and federal power. Now, if you can't have fun with that, I don't know what. <laughs> but our point is how young emerging leaders perceive recent and future constitutional change. As Audrey said, we're continuing our 20th anniversary. But I also want you to know how proud we are of our students that participate in our Dole Student uh, advisory board. They have an opportunity to choose their own program uh, each semester, and they can choose their speaker, and they moderate. And I think that's a learning experience outside of the classroom. As I part, Audrey told you how excited we are, well, I am. But before we do that, we know that September the 17th was Constitutional Day. And you can 
have a program before that date or after that date, and we generally choose after the date. And on Saturday, we had Constitution Day at Memorial Stadium, and we won that game. <laughs> so, and uh, that was really nice. And the chancellor led the preamble, and the people in the stands participated as well. So we also know that on September the 17th, 1787, the Constitution was signed by 39 of the 55 founding fathers. In 2004, President George W. Bush signed a bill designating the 17th of September as Constitution Day. And if people remember from the beginning, it was Colin Powell that initiated all of the whatever around all the states. At 11 o'clock, it was on the Pacific Coast, and then, you know, we, we got it at 12, and New York got it at 1. And we had a school come to Wesco Beach. For those of you who don't know who Wesco Beach is, it's not a beach, but it is on main campus. And we did that. So one of the things Colin Powell said, we would all do the preamble to the Constitution, and you have it in your program as well. So. As we do this, you can ring your bells if you are holding them and you accepted them, and our guest speakers will also ring their bells. So let's start with the preamble. Ready? We, we the, the people, people of the United States, States in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. Thank you very much. I will now just briefly highlight the credentials of our guests this evening. The rest you can read for yourself, but I did want to highlight a few. I'll start with Jersey Bank, Jesse Burbank. He hails from Quinter, Kansas. And you will notice that I will tell you where they came from because I have a point I will make. <laughs> so Jesse <laughs> hails from Quinter, Kansas. And he grew up moving around the world in a military family. He earned his bachelor's degree with highest distinction in history and political science from the University of Kansas in 2017. He was a member of the Dole Student Advisory Board. And he also served as Dole Institute Director Bill Lacey's research assistant during his senior year. He earned his law degree with honors from Harvard Law in 2020. He is now a captain in the US Army, and he serves as a special victims counsel at Fort Riley, representing survivors of sexual assault and related offenses throughout the military uh, justice process. Next, I will introduce M.D. DePew. M.D. DePew is a research attorney with the Kansas Court of Appeals. She hails from Neotache, Kansas. She earned her Bachelor of General Science degree in history, political science, and women, gender, and sexuality studies with a minor in Latin American and Caribbean studies from the University of Kansas. She graduated from the University of Kansas School of Law in 2023. And at KU Law, she was a three-time moot court national champion. Now I will let Adam Steinhilber. He hails from Olin Park, Kansas. He recently finished clerking for the Honorable Timothy, oh, I didn't ask you, is it Timkovich? Uh, Timkovich, yep. Okay, I reckon I write Timkovich of uh, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit. He earned his J.D. magna cum laude from the University of Michigan Law School, where he was elected to the Order of the Cough and chaired the Federalist Society's 39th Annual National Student Symposium. And he earned his B.A. in political science with honors from the University of Kansas. Right. You have like a snapshot <laughs> And even what we, the rest of it, does not tell you what these three people have actually done. But I did want you to know something about them before we started. So I'm going to start with a question. And we had an opportunity to meet by Zoom. Why is the Constitution important? I'll start with Adam. All right. 
Thank you, Dr. Ballard, and thank you, everyone. It's so wonderful to be back here at the Dole. I just moved back to KC, and it's very fitting that I would come to back to the Dole so soon. Uh, so why is the Constitution so important? Because it is the foundation of our government. The Constitution sets forth a government of limited powers, which is so unique in the world because it constrains the government. It places people in power, and that's wonderful. Uh, you know, it's a blessing that we all have as Americans that other countries have tried to copy and emulate. And it's the Constitution that is so hard to change, and that's also wonderful. That can be really frustrating at times, and sometimes it's not changed soon enough. But what that system means is that if we want change as a nation, we really have to mean it. We have to fight for it, and it has to be something really, really important. The Constitution grounds our government, and it grounds our rights, and it ensures most of the freedoms that we have today. Okay, Jesse? Well, first off, thank you, Dr. Ballard. Thank you for the invitation back to the Dole Institute. And uh, quick housekeeping that anything I say tonight not be on behalf of the military in any way. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that it's important to examine first principles like questions like why the Constitution matters sometimes. So our government is one of enumerated limited powers. And the framers put that in place because they were worried about a government that overreaches, a government that takes too much from people without consent. So our constitution is, in a sense, our socio-political contract under the, ter the terms of which we will live together as a federal republic, as a people, and as a nation. Um, there's all sorts of different uh, ideas of how you're supposed to interpret it, whether it remains fixed in time or whether it evolves, but it is the foundational document of a country that I think we can all be proud of. Emily, please. Thank you, Barbara, so much for hosting me and also Audrey, all three of us. I think it's a real pleasure for the three of us as former students to be back here. I'll also quickly echo what Jesse stated, which is nothing I say, you know, uh, nothing I say, don't hold it against the Court of Appeals or the judicial <laughs> branch. Um, but I think that, you know, in, in talking about the judicial branch, uh, last week, Chief Justice Marla Lukert of the Kansas Supreme Court uh, issued a statement where she discussed the importance of Constitution Day. And one of the things she stated was not only was it a privilege to interpret the Constitution, but that she thought it was, um, it was a necessity that every single person take it upon themselves to learn more about the Constitution. And that, that was in part because uh, the changes that we wish to see in the world, our dreams, um, what we want to see change to alter our personal ideologies, whatever it may be, can be accomplished through a better knowledge of the Constitution, can be accomplished uh, through taking part in the judicial process. It doesn't always have to be through uh, the political realm. And I thought that that quote really encapsulated uh, the importance of the Constitution and Constitution Day is that a better understanding of it can really help us um, have a special toolkit in navigating, uh, in navigating our hopes and our dreams. All right. Well, let's start with, tell us about your upbringing, <coughs> uh, a little bit about your K-12 through 12 mm -hmm. education, and how did you all decide on a law career? Yeah, I can start again. Um, so like Dr. Ballard said, I'm originally from Overland Park, and growing up, I loved social studies. It was my favorite subject in elementary school and middle school. Uh, and like a lot of kids who are drawn to history and government, I was ultimately drawn to the law. And I think a big part of that was because I could see and recognize that so many of the people who have had such a positive impact on our country were lawyers, were judges, were other people involved in the lawmaking process, like legislators. And I wanted to be a part of that. And I thought it'd be really cool to be a lawyer and have that opportunity to help make a positive impact. And that desire kind of started with me in elementary and middle school, stuck with me through high school. I did a youth court in high school, which was really fun. I did speech and debate, like many lawyers do when they're in high school. And then when I got to KU, I did student government, which also inspired me to go into law school. Uh, and you know, the interest just really stuck with me. And so I ultimately went to law school. I loved it. And going into law school, I knew that I wanted to clerk afterwards. Clerking is working for judges, helping them with research and writing uh, when it comes to opinions and preparing for oral arguments. 
And I knew that a lot of successful attorneys did it, and I knew that it was a great exposure to the judicial system. And because I developed an affinity for appellate practice pretty early in law school, I really wanted to clerk for a couple of appellate judges, uh, which I was thankfully able to do both on a state Supreme Court as well as on a federal circuit court. All right, Jesse. All right, so uh, as Dr. Ballard said, I am originally from Quinter, Kansas, in sort of the far western reaches of the state, almost to Colorado. Um, but my dad joined the military uh, when I was very young, served 25 years as a chaplain in the Army. And so I grew up moving around all over the place, uh, bopping around the United States, around Europe. We lived briefly in South Korea. And I think that that gave a pretty rich perspective on the United States in the world, on its role in the world, and on sort of the place that I wanted to find in that world. So I graduated from high school in Virginia um, and came right on back here to KU, uh, where my, my father also went. I guess I'm just sort of reliving his experience in many ways. <laughs> uh, and just absolutely loved it. Um, I had this moment at the end of high school where I thought, you know, I haven't done too well academically growing up. Maybe I should make a plan. And so what are my skills? What am I interested in? Uh, I was okay at speech and debate, loved history, okay at research and writing. So I was not great at math, <laughs> sciences, so you know, ophthalmology and all that was off the table. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, okay, I guess uh, maybe I'll go to law school. Looked up the expected incomes at a law firm, and I'm like, okay, it's sold right there. <laughs> um, so I arrived here at KU with sort of a vague idea that I'd like to go to law school and got involved with the Dole immediately when I came here. I remember sitting right out there on that patio, uh, on the patio for patio, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, 10 years ago, almost to the month, uh, and Director Bill Lacey and Susie, his wife Susie, came up, sat down uh, at my table, started talking about the Dole Institute of Politics, what they do here, all the amazing guests that they bring through, and I was hooked from the very start. Uh, and so from that base, I've tried to live out what I want to do in the world, make a difference, make a purposeful life for myself, and support others do something meaningful and worthwhile while doing it. I'll save the rest for future questions. All right, Yemni. Thank you, yeah, I had a special treat of doing a quick mic change, so hopefully I don't break anything else up here, but we will see. It looks like this uh, Liberty Bell is already broken, so <laughs> I, I don't have to do that. Um, Yes, yeah, so I grew up. In, I grew up in Southeast Kansas, a small town called Neodache. However, Senator Dole, anytime I would say that, would always, uh, you know, kind of put his finger at me and say, "That's not really that small." Like he knew small, and Neodache was not that small for him. And I grew up. My mom was a school teacher. My dad was an attorney. They're both here tonight. Thank you so much for driving up to see us uh, talk about the Constitution. And my dad specifically specializes in bankruptcy law, which now I don't have any interest in. But growing up, I thought it was, I thought it was interesting because I had asked him, you know, why would you choose bankruptcy as a, a specific specialization within the practice of law? And he talked about how important it was for him to help people start a new life, a new chapter in their book. And I really think that is something that the practice of law is exceptional at, is that uh, sometimes we don't always get to see people in their finest moments. Sometimes this is the roughest moment in their entire life. And as an attorney, we're charged with helping them and helping them get to, to turn that page to the next chapter. So that really initially inspired me to, to, to engage in the idea of law. And when I arrived at KU, I came to the Dole Institute, took part in the student advisory board, which was really great for my passions of policy and politics and interest into those subjects. But I also had the opportunity to engage in the undergraduate mock trial team, where essentially we put on a, a simulated trial. You got to be both a witness and attorney. And what was so fantastic about that is that I had the opportunity to think about strategy. How am I going to object to this witness's statement so I can get it into evidence or so it won't be on the record? And that strategy was so fun to me. What case law can I use to support my objection? 
Um, how can I frame this argument with the federal rules of evidence that, that will bolster the strength of my argument? And I just found that so interesting. And so that led me to go to KU Law, uh, where KU Law has historically had a very strong advocacy program. And so I immediately signed up for the moot court program at KU, which is different than mock trial. Mock trial is, you know, district court, uh, trial court level of a, kind of a fake proceeding, but moot court is appellate level. And I think I had overheard um, Adam talk a little bit about his passions for appellate work. And I just absolutely enjoyed and loved moot court as much as I did with mock trial because I loved <coughs> engaging with the strategy behind thinking, you know, how do I make this argument? How do I look at other cases to support this argument? What are my weak arguments and how do I fix those to make sure that the judges side with me? I found that so intriguing. So that of course led me to the, the current spot I am, which is a research attorney on the Kansas Court of Appeals. All right, thank you. Well, we're gonna get into our speech <clears throat> guns in federal power. And what we decided on is that each of our guests will take the lead on one of these topics and the others will also chime in if they choose to do so. So with Adam, mm -hmm. you have speech. I do. So let's turn to the Supreme Court's upturn, upcoming term. Yeah. Talk about what might be in store for mm -hmm. the court's First Amendment free speech <coughs> doctrine and then you may want to go into <coughs> the court has changed a lot in recent years. Mm -hmm. How would you describe the court's approach to the First Amendment? Sure. All right, so there's actually a lot that's going on when it comes to First Amendment speech protections. Uh, so I'll try and be brief, but I don't know how possible that will be. Uh, <laughs> and that's really good for you all because a lot of these cases are really fun. And you learn that very quickly in law school that First Amendment stuff is super fun, it's super complicated, because the fact patterns are so interesting. And that's what we had this upcoming term. So one, one issue that I wanna highlight is being addressed by the court in a couple cases, one out of Michigan, one out of California. And this is, when is it a violation of the First Amendment for a public official to block a constituent on social media? Uh, you know, I'm sure you're all very familiar with social media and how politicians and government officials use it to communicate, to campaign, and to inform others. Now, the issue arises because a few officials did in fact block constituents who were critical of them. So in the Michigan case, there was a city manager who had a uh, Facebook page that had originally been his personal profile, but he had too many friends, so he turned it into a public page. And yes, he posted stuff about work there, but he also posted stuff about his family, pictures, personal stuff of that nature. Uh, but a constituent was upset about uh, the city's response to COVID-19, and he made many critical comments on the page, and so the official blocked him. The constituent sued and wanted to find a First Amendment violation. Now, the federal district court said that there was no violation, and the court of appeals affirmed. It affirmed because the Facebook page was not part of the city manager's job. He received no money for it, and it wasn't entirely a business page. He used it for a lot of personal interests. And so this case is called Lynn Kiwi Freed, and it's out of the Sixth Circuit in Michigan. But in California, things went the opposite way. So there, a couple of candidates for school board trustee created campaign social media pages uh, that used them to campaign. They won, and once they won, they changed over those pages to basically reflect their positions as official school board trustees. This case is called O'Connor Ratcliffe v. Garnier. And you know they would use their pages to solicit feedback from constituents. Uh, they identified themselves as the trustees. Again, they were not required to do this. They received no marketing budget or anything uh, to incentivize them to have these pages. And lo and behold, again, there were some parents who were critical of them. They made those comments. They got blocked. The parents sued, except this time the parents won. Because the Federal District Court and the Ninth Circuit found that the trustees were acting as government actors when they were running the pages because they basically held themselves out as government actors using these pages. These were distinct from their personal accounts uh, and for all intents and purposes, just looking at it, one would assume it was a professional account. And both courts came out, the courts came out the opposite way, which is called a circuit split in the legal field. And generally when there's a circuit split, 
uh, the U.S. Supreme Court will take it and will answer it. And so those are a couple of cases that are going to be pretty interesting to look at because, you know, a lot of elected officials, a lot of legislature, legislators <coughs> have their Twitter feeds, their Twitter accounts, their Facebook pages, their Instagram pages, and they're all going to be f impacted because if they want to block someone, that could be a First Amendment violation. Mm -hmm. So that's something to look forward to. Another case is actually a trademark dispute, um, which is super interesting. So another thing you learn in law school, if there is a trademark dispute, it's probably really cool. Uh, <laughs> it honestly <laughs> is, right? Like the patent disputes, they're a little boring. Trademark disputes are fun because it's stuff that impacts us every day. Like we all see the logos, we all see the, the designs, and it's stuff we think about. Now this case, Vital v. Elster, uh, stems, goes back to the 2016 Republican primary. So you may recall that there was an allegation during uh, that campaign season that part of President Trump, uh, then candidate Trump, was too small. Uh, his hands, his hands were too small. Uh, <laughs> and an individual wanted to trademark the term Trump too small and sell t-shirts with that on it. Uh, however, when he went to register it, the federal government rejected his trademark application. Now it rejected the application, not because it was critical of Trump, but because it mentioned Trump. Now there's a federal prohibition against using a trademark that mentions a living person without their written consent. And the government believed that, okay, obviously he's referring to Donald Trump here, therefore it is in violation of this federal statute, we can't register the trademark. Uh, well, he appealed, and the federal circuit court there sided with him. It said the government did not have any First Amendment interest in rejecting a trademark that was critical of a public official uh, or other public figure. And so the Biden administration then asked the United States Supreme Court to review this and say, no, 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 we can reject this trademark. And so that's a really interesting case. Uh, and the Supreme Court has actually kind of been on a streak lately of rejecting these trademark restrictions. A couple of years ago in 2017 in a case, uh, they struck down a prohibition on disparaging trademarks in a case involving the Slants or an Asian American rock band uh, who called themselves the Slants because that's generally been a slur for Asians and Asian Americans but they wanted to take it back. The trademark office rejected it, but the Supreme Court said, no, 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 you have to allow them to trademark it. The First Amendment says so. Uh, then a couple years later, in another case, there was an artist who wanted to trademark F-U-C-T, um, so spell that out and then say it to yourselves. And you might imagine why the trademark office said no, <laughs> F-U-C-T, um, because it was immoral or scandalous, which again is another statutory pro prohibition. Again, the U.S. Supreme Court said, no, 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 the First Amendment trumps that. So the Supreme Court is on a hot streak with these trademark cases. Um, so if I'm a betting man, I would probably bet on them coming out on the side of the Trump too small trademark uh, in this case. So that's kind of a preview of the upcoming term. Uh, then you also want to look back a little bit, Dr. Ballard. Mm -hmm. um, you know, generally, the U.S. Supreme Court has been pretty protective of free speech rights. You know, it's defended right, the right to not pledge allegiance to the flag if you're in a public school. Uh, among other things, you know, very old case, a lot of people are familiar with it, and it's generally continued that streak. But in recent years, the court has become even more protective of the First Amendment. So there are those two trademark cases that I just mentioned, uh, very protective of the First Amendment. And then this past term, the court had a case on compelled speech called 303 Creative versus Alanis. Now, that case was out of the Tenth Circuit, uh, which is based in Denver and includes Kansas. So quick question, how many people here have heard of Masterpiece Cake Shop? Raise your hands. Masterpiece Cake Shop, anyone here? Okay, good amount of people have heard of it. Um, so if you have heard of Masterpiece Cake Shop, 303 Creative is Masterpiece, except with a website instead of cakes. Uh, if you have not heard of Masterpiece, it was a case involving a suburban Denver baker who rejected a request to make a wedding cake for a same-sex wedding. Uh, the court ultimately punted on the issue of whether or not the baker could refuse to bake the cake uh, based on the First Amendment because it found that Colorado, Colorado which tried to enforce its anti-discrimination law, had messed up by making some comments that were uh, negative about his religious beliefs during the administrative process, and that violated the Constitution. Now, flash forward a bit, and we get to 303 Creative. It involves Lori Smith, again, a website designer in Denver, uh, but she doesn't do wedding websites, however she wants to. But she's a devout Christian and does not want to make wedding websites that disagree with her beliefs. So a wedding website for a same-sex wedding. And so she sued various Colorado officials uh, 
basically to get a federal court to say that Colorado cannot enforce its Anti-Discrimination Act against her if she refuses to make one of these websites. This is called a pre-enforcement challenge, and it's very well recognized and accepted in the legal profession. Uh, and she, when she sued, she and the state of Colorado agreed to a few facts, including that her websites were custom, they were expressive, they were personalized, people would know she made them, and that she would serve any customer regardless of their sexual orientation, but she would draw the line at the content of the website if she did not agree with it. Uh, the District of Colorado cited against her, and the Tenth Circuit also cited against her in a two-to-one decision. It was actually authored by Judge Mary Beck Briscoe, who has her chambers here in Lawrence. Uh, there was a dissent. Full disclosure, the dissent was by Judge Timothy M. Timkovich, who I worked for. Um, I was not involved in that dissent at all. <laughs> um, that was before my time. And Judge Timkovich said I could talk about what is public about the case, which is what I'm doing here. Um, and the U.S. Supreme Court took the case, and it ultimately sided with Ms. Smith. It said that this was an issue of compelled speech, that the state of Colorado uh, would basically force Ms. Smith to make a website, to make a statement with which she did not agree. And the court has long held, whether it's the Pledge of Allegiance, whether it's allowing certain groups into a public parade, uh, whether it's allowing a gay scoutmaster to be part of the Boy Scouts, that there are strong rights of expressive association, and that Colorado could not compel her to make a website uh, that had a method a message with which she disagreed. And this is a really interesting case, and it remains to be seen now what its impact will be. On the one hand, it is a bit narrow because, like I said earlier, the state of Colorado made a lot of very important concessions or stipulations early on in the lawsuit, and without those, there might have been a different outcome. I don't think so, but it would have at least been a harder case for Ms. Smith. Uh, however, it is somewhat broad in the sense that it is a reaffirmation that the government cannot generally compel speech. And so looking forward, I think courts are generally going to have to consider what is speech in terms of these public accommodation laws. Um, uh, like, you know, many states have them, like the state of Colorado, you can't discriminate on the basis of a customer's gender, sexual orientation, uh, race, religion, et cetera, et cetera, and draw the line at, okay, a website might be speech, so we can't make you do that, but what about a wedding cake? Or what about pre-made brownies? Or what about the chair rental guy for the wedding? or the flower arranger. That was also a case out of Washington State involving flower arrangements for weddings. Uh, the US Supreme Court actually didn't end up taking that case. It's called Arlene's Flowers. Um, but this is an issue that's commonly risen. And there's another one out in Oregon that I believe the US Supreme Court sent back to the Oregon Court of Appeals in light of uh, its decision in 303 Creative. So you know, kind of looking back recently with the trademark cases, with 303 Creative, um, with some other cases that I'll save if we have Q&A for. Um, the court has been very protective of First Amendment rights when it comes to free expression. All right. uh, some notes on those cases, I think. Uh, first, it's always hilarious to see the justices try to grapple with anything social media. Like, like none of them have any idea what they're yes. doing. None of them have personal accounts. You know, they're reading about this in the briefs. Um, but on the social media cases, it seems pretty likely that the local officials are going to prevail on their ability to block people on their private accounts from commenting on their posts, even if they're using these accounts uh, for a mix of public and private purposes. But one interesting side note on that is if you agree that that is private protected speech on the part of the elected official and they're not violating the free speech rights of their constituents by blocking them on those pages, you have to think about like, okay, what about the President of the United States? Like, is his personal account truly his personal account. And I mean, we've had a social media president um, yeah. just prior to this president, and a series of cases were working their way up through the federal court system related to his blocking of over 40 different individuals. And whether him blocking those people on what used to be Twitter constituted a violation of their First Amendment rights. So the Southern District of New York held that it did. The Second Circuit, uh, so the Circuit Court above the Southern District of New York, held that it did. Mm -hmm. But then the case was resolved on mutinous grounds because President Trump cycled out of office. You have to wonder how far that logic is going to go. We're sure, like the member of the school board might be able to say whatever they want on their pub on their private pages mm -hmm. with like you know Aunt Sally commenting or whatever. But what about the President of the United States? Can they so easily silence people from commenting on their social media materials? That's going to be a big point of contention, probably, on the court. They're going to have to be very delicate 
in their opinion yet. Um, and we'll just have to see where they come out on that. Uh, 303 Creative, as Adam said, mm -hmm. he's the, the biggest 303 fan in the world, by the way. So just a <laughs> heads up there. Um, it does seem like the court is going to embark on a route of being less and less favorable towards anything it sees as compelled speech. And although that case was resolved on free speech grounds, this will probably go hand in hand with the court's increasing focus on religious liberty as well, which is a part of the First Amendment that did not control in 303, but oftentimes goes hand in hand with free speech rights. So we'll just have to see where that goes. And I will note, that's a good point, Jesse. So the Tenth Circuit, when it sided uh, against Ms. Smith, it decided against her both on free speech grounds and on free exercise grounds. But the US Supreme Court only took the case on free speech grounds, so it did not consider the religious aspects. So thank you for pointing that out. Okay. I'm not as much of an oracle as these two are in predicting cases. <laughs> um, but I do think that Jesse really hit the nail on the head in regards to, I, I know it was kind of a, a funny comment that the, you know these justices probably don't have Facebook pages of themselves, but I think you can really see that reflected in the briefing. And what I mean by that is a young lawyer, I'm still trying to grapple with how do I become a more effective writer? How do I become uh, better at, at advocacy? And I think both of those cases that Adam discussed are uh, from both briefs do a really excellent job of describing the facts in the case. Because as you can imagine, these are very fact-intensive cases. Is the most of the time the city manager posting about the, the COVID drive-through uh, booster shot? Is most of the time the city manager posting about his daughter? Um, to, you know, what is reflected in the profile picture of the city manager? These are very fact-intensive questions. And I think briefings from both sides, from both parties in, in the Freed case, the city manager case, do a great job for young attorneys looking to uh, be more effective writers and describing um, and, and weighing the, the facts, both the strengths for their side and the weaknesses. In addition, the, uh, the other case from California that is both, I think, Twitter and Facebook focused, it describes in detail how these social media, um, social media platforms work. What is a profile? What is a page? What is blocking someone? And once again, you don't really think about it, but when you're writing, that is really hard to write about. How do you describe to someone what a comment is on a, on a page? And it, like I said, it might sound easy, but it's much tougher than it seems. And I think that the, the four briefs in those two cases are really good examples of figuring out as, as young attorneys or future attorneys, how to write a good fact section, how to minimize weaknesses in your fact section, but also um, you know, uh, broaden the strengths of what you have to work with in your case. All right. Well, now we're going to move to guns. <laughs> now, we all have our own opinion about guns, whether it's all the shootings in the schools or what happened in the supermarket or what happens at a post office and everything else. But we're going to get more down to what will the Supreme Court be dealing with. They have lots of things on the docket, and we only chose three of those. So, Jesse, this will be your area. How has the meaning of the Second Amendment changed in the last two years? And what could this coming term mean for the court's approach to firearms restrictions? All right, thank you. I get to be the gun guy here, always <laughs> fun. Um, so the meaning of the Second Amendment has actually changed dramatically um, over, I would say, the last 15 years especially. So just a quick recitation of the text. I'm sure I'll botch it in some way. Um, but it, it goes, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the preservation of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Uh, you know, a grammatically incorrect uh, amendment, lots of weird comma placement going on in there. But basically, for much of the history of the country, the court had taken that preface, a well-regulated militia, to be sort of the purpose of that amendment. Now, that changed dramatically in 2008 in a case um, called Heller, 
uh, that held for the first time that the Second Amendment is actually an individual right um, on the part of you know, the people to keep and bear arms. And then in 2010, that right was incorporated against the states um, in a case called McDonald. So basically, we have hundreds of years of firearms regulation um, that was sort of done on the, press, the, the supposition that you know, the state would be able to regulate it in pretty much any way without facing a serious Second Amendment challenge, all being upended in 2008 with the introduction of this being an individual right held by law-abiding citizens. There are all sorts of caveats in those rulings, like, of course, you can uh, circumscribe gun possession in certain sensitive spaces, churches, hospitals, that sort of stuff. Um, and you can stop felons or other uh, convicted criminals from owning guns. You know, reasonable regulations were okay. But in general, this was an individual right. Uh, now, the court sort of put those two precedents out into the world and saw what came out of them um, and basically went on hiatus uh, until 2022. Um, didn't really have any additional pronouncements on the topic, at least serious ones, for some time. And I think what the court saw happening was a series of lower court judges um, creating standards of review for different gun regulations, under which you know most gun regulations would probably be okay. So even though the court reoriented that entire field of law, um, I think that the court sensed that the lower courts were sort of not really getting the message on what the court was going to say. So in 2022, uh, just about two terms ago here, um, there was a case called Bruin, under which the court set out a brand new standard here. Uh, now, gun regulations, if they are against the face of the Second Amendment, against you know, that really arcane language that I said, and that they present any restriction on firearms ownership, then those restrictions must be deeply rooted in history and tradition in the US legal system. Um, now, those modern restrictions can be analogous in different ways to historical restrictions. They don't need to be precisely the same, but they need to either have similar purposes or similar structures to them that can make them uh, permissible under the Constitution. Now, you might imagine, what is the history and tradition of American gun regulation? And how are you going to analogize any of these new regulations to historical ones? We have a case coming up here called Rahimi, mm -hmm. uh, which is going to be the first bite at that apple. Uh, and the briefs are as messy as you might imagine. Um, in this case, uh, it is probably the best possible set of facts for the government, I will say. The government is trying to uphold a federal statute under which it's unlawful for individuals who are subject to a domestic violence restraining order that says either this person is dangerous or this person is prohibited commit from committing violence. Um, a person under that restraining order <coughs> can't possess guns, can't buy, can't sell, excuse me, cannot um, purchase a gun, and you can't transfer a gun to them. Now we have this guy, Rahimi, who is the least sympathetic person in the world. Mm -hmm. um, between December 2020 and January 2021, he was involved in five separate shootings, some of them drive-bys, one at a Whataburger, actually, um, when his friend's credit card was declined, and he decided to just fire shots into the air at the rest, like just a ridiculous clown, you know? <laughs> um, now he was subject to one of these restraining orders. Um, and as you might imagine, there are a lot of charges on his charge sheet, but one that he is trying to get rid of is this firearms possession charge by a person under a domestic violence um, restraining order. So when it comes down to it, if you're judging the briefs based on which does the best job of analogizing to the history and tradition of American firearms regulation, it's probably Rahimi's case right now. But you also have this awful set of facts, where is the Supreme Court really going to say that uh, if you are subject to a domestic violence restraining order, then your Second Amendment rights are fully intact. This will be a very difficult case for them to evaluate, I think, and for them to come down on. It'll probably involve them refining their standard from Bruin quite a bit, um, especially in light of just you know these types of facts. But it will give a lot more clarity on what honestly is just an incredibly new field for the court. Like, most of these amendments have highly developed doctrines over centuries. This doctrine kind of got the reset button in 2008. 
and it's unclear where it's going to go from here. So, you know, watch this space. Yes. And, you know, I'd just like to point out that how unique it is that the court is taking this case basically two years, um, probably issue an opinion in 2014, so two years after the Bruin opinion, and that's real quick. Uh, you know, often the U.S. Supreme Court will issue an opinion, uh, set forth a new test, and, you know, if there are issues that arise, it'll see how lower courts deal with it over several years, you know, let the issue percolate a bit. Um, here the court is really jumping on it, and that's because I think, as Jesse pointed out, uh, you know, it's such a new test in Bruin, and as anyone who has any experience in criminal law knows, uh, felon in possession cases or someone possess possessing a gun who cannot make up a large portion of the federal docket. There are thousands of felon in possession cases. Um, you know, just by simply being a felon, you cannot have a firearm. Uh, there are other various um, aspects of that as well. For example, Hunter Biden, like one of his charges is a gun charge. He could not have a firearm because he was addicted to drugs when he possessed it. Uh, and then there are also state charges as well for illegal possession of a firearm. And so I think that's a bit of why the court was uh, so eager to take up this case so quickly, because there are so many of these cases um, that could turn uh, and could be impacted by the court's analysis of the Bruin test and how it applies to test. Um, you know, it's not just the domestic, the you know, defendant who's under a domestic violence order. Violence order. Uh, it's you know all these other felon in possession cases. It's, it's any case that involves a firearm at all. So I think that's why there's a lot of urgency here. Okay. Earlier, I was describing how I uh, have an affinity for. Um, being an advocate, especially in a moot court setting. And when Bruin came down, I thought it was really interesting that this court was taking this historical practices and understandings approach. As Barbara stated earlier, an undergrad, I graduated uh, with a major in history. So I'd like to say that I'm kind of a trained historian. And I really think that it will be thought provoking going forward to see how these advocates handle kind of a role of a historian. As Jesse described, uh, you know, the, the, recent, uh, the recent jurisprudence from the Supreme Court kind of dates back to this Heller case. And in Heller, uh, the justices looked at historical dictionaries dating back to the 18th century. They looked at state constitutions. They looked at, and as Jesse was talking about, uh, trying to find an analog in Rahimi to a law that, was, uh, that would be similar to the United States Code that they're arguing about in this specific case. So I think going forward, it will just be very intriguing to see how advocates handle that. And, and it, it doesn't necessarily stop with the Second Amendment. Um, recently, I don't know if any of you have heard of the Kennedy case, which was maybe more colloquially known as the football prayer case. Mm -hmm. um, and there, the court, uh, uh, they may have overturned or may have abandoned a very long establishment clause from the First Amendment. Uh, a test called Lemon. And they, instead of going back to this very uh, long established case, they've turned, like the Second Amendment, to this historical practices and understandings. So, you know, being an advocate in front of the Supreme Court is above my pay grade, but I think from, from sitting here in Kansas, it'll be interesting to see if these advocates transform more into historians and what the role of history has uh, in the Supreme Court's jurisprudence. Mm -hmm. All right. I think you have heard a um, very diverse opinion. Thank you so very much. Well, now we're going to move on to federal powers. And Emily DePue will take the lead on this. There's been a lot of talk lately about the power of the federal agencies, or what some people call the administrative state. What could this term mean for the power of federal agencies? It could mean so much, Barbara, and that is because, as, as you stated, there's been so much talk about the term administrative state or the power of agencies. Now, if you were like me and are a little less educated on the government coming into undergrad or probably even law school, I didn't really know the full extent of the power of a federal agency. Um, and, and the best way for me to describe this is someone who had the opportunity to be a legal intern in the Department of United States Department of Transportation is something like the Federal Aviation Administration and the FAA. If you ever go to an airport, you may hear over the intercom or an airline stewardess say, according to FAA rules and regulations, we have to do X, Y, and Z. 
Now that is part of a process called rulemaking. Rulemaking occurs uh, within these agencies many times when there are gaps to fill within a statute. As you can imagine, statutes are, are, are very long and um, very descriptive, but not always. And there are many reasons why there are gaps in legislation. It could be that the legislator themselves doesn't want to address a specific issue within the legislation. It could be that that problem that the agency initial, or eventually found out about wasn't even contemplated at the drafting stage of the statute. And so there are a lot of reasons why there are these gaps in the statutes that agencies um, have to fill through this rulemaking process. But that is not without its critics. There are a lot of, um, there's a lot of controversy that, you know, these federal agencies with public servants who are not elected are getting to choose more or less kind of like the laws of our country in regards to these gap fillers and statutes. And like I said, some people are not a fan of that. Other people might say that uh, that's great that agencies have the opportunity to fill these statutory gaps because they're the experts in the field. If you think of something like the EPA, the, uh, the Clean Air Act, some of those, uh, uh, that statute can get really complex very quickly. And so some people might say it is great to just let the experts deal with it and it's not the role of the courts to intervene and to understand or try to understand uh, the gaps within the statutory language. Now that brings about a, a very famous case. Uh, some of you may have heard, because it probably I would say is the most famous case in administrative law. Uh, it's, it's called Chevron and what developed from it was the Chevron Doctrine. It was a case from 1984. Interestingly, it was only decided by six justices. Um, and in this coming term, we have a case that we don't always have in front of the Supreme Court. Uh, it's not every day you see this type of question presented. And the case asks, should we overturn the Chevron Doctrine? Now you might ask, what is the Chevron Doctrine? Well, it was a case about the EPA and uh, the, I believe, the Clean Air Act. And what it essentially stated was that in these acts that I was describing, if, if Congress has made clear or through the court's um, ability through statutory interpretation, use of canons of construction, is able to see that the court, or that, that Congress has made clear uh, this, this, uh, this thing that the agency is interpreting, this language that the uh, agency is interpreting, then we will stick with what Congress stated. But if there is silence in the statute, there's a gap to fill, there's ambiguity, we will let the, the experts, the agencies, uh, have their opinion on their interpretation so long as that opinion is reasonable. Over time, uh, this is like I stated, you know, have, has become uh, a controversial. There's both judges and justices across the board who are in favor of Chevron, but, but many who aren't. Um, and, and some have on the court made their feelings quite clear. Uh, ju uh, Justice Gorsuch, then Judge Gorsuch, wrote an opinion on the Tenth Circuit making clear that, uh, that this country uh, once saw the days before Chevron and we can see the days after it. Uh, Chief Justice, in a dissenting opinion in a case called City of Arlington, also expressed skepticism over the Chevron Doctrine. He said if the Founding Fathers saw this, quote, administrative state today, they would be rubbing their eyes. And so that brings before the court today this Loper Bright case that uh, asked the court to overturn this Chevron Doctrine or alternatively, which just means that if you don't agree with our first argument, I hope you agree with our sec second argument. Alternatively, can you cabin or constrain the Chevron doctrine? Um, and it'll be interesting to see what exactly happens in this case. Essentially, uh, it's, it's an agency with, uh, within the Department of Commerce that is interpreting a fisheries act and the, the specific fact and issue at play is that uh, this act states that the federal, or that this agency has the power to authorize monitors to stand on these commercial fishing vessels 
and to, uh, and, and to see and make sure that these federal rules are being followed. Now the question comes, because it, it appears the statute is silent, is whether the agency can uh, in, uh, force these commercial fishing vessels to pay for the cost of a federal monitor, for someone to stand on the fishing ves vessel and ensure uh, the rules are being properly followed. And uh, of course, both sides are gonna make their own arguments there, but arguably, the statute is unclear or silent as to that specific issue. So uh, Paul Clement, who is some of you may have heard of, I believe he was here for, I don't know if it was a Constitution Day program, but he was here several years ago. He's a uh, very famous uh, litigator in the Supreme Court bar. Um, and he is arguing for the petitioners, asking the court to overturn Chevron. And, uh, and, and, and he, uh, excuse me, in, the, in Loper Bright, the petitioners, the, the, um, the commercial fishing vessel interest, they're asking the court to uh, alternatively find uh, or cabin or constrain this Chevron doctrine. You might ask, what might that look like? Uh, it is possible that, that this uh, act that they're interpreting, it could be that the court uh, might decide that no longer can, uh, can courts interpret statutes that are silent or have a gap within the act that the agency has to interpret. Maybe it's only when the agency uh, is interpreting an act and it's ambiguous. There are a multitude of ways the court may cabin or constrain Chevron, but ultimately uh, this, uh, this specific case might wholly change uh, the future of administrative law within this country. All right. And uh, just some notes on that. If the facts in Rahimi were terrible, the facts in Loper are pristine. Um, <laughs> so this is a small fishing village operation uh, forced to cover the costs of monitors and researchers that come aboard its vessels, you know, pay the salaries for mm -hmm. these people which uh, has turned out to be quite considerable. Um, sometimes over 20% of the value of the fish that they catch each day uh, goes just towards paying the salaries of the researchers and monitors aboard their mm -hmm. vessels. Um, so of course it's having a, a very strong and deleterious effect on the village and you know, the, I'm sure there will be a lot of heartstrings to pull on that. Um, but I think that the court has signaled uh, that Chevron is now probably a disfavored doctrine hasn't mm -hmm. applied it itself in eight years, um, often refuses to cite to it. And I think that now it's coming to believe that it gave too broad of a grant mm -hmm. to the agencies. Um, and that has a number of negative effects. There are separation of powers considerations where it's concerned that Congress is ceding too much of its authority mm -hmm. um, through these you know, very broad statutory grants to the agencies. Um, effectively ceding its legislative authority. Mm -hmm. um, it also is concerned about whether this sort of broad grant of power allows presidential administrations to just whiplash back and forth wildly in interpretations of laws mm -hmm. um, just through the rulemaking process, creating a lot of destabilizing environments for businesses and people uh, that just want to have settled expectations for how they're going to conduct their lives. Chevron gives a massive amount of deference to the agencies mm -hmm. in reformulating its interpretation on a dime, so long as it goes through uh, the proper procedures under the Administrative Procedure Act. So I think that the court has signaled that it's skeptical mm -hmm. of the administrative state generally, probably thinks it has too broad of a grant in the Chevron doctrine, which at the time was not a very controversial doctrine, but has become more controversial over the years. And it's likely that it will at least be narrowed in some way, if not you know, dramatically overturned mm -hmm. in a very splashy fashion. If that were to occur, by the way, so many cases have been settled on Chevron basis. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very difficult to see what happens to all of those cases if the central pillar of them is suddenly knocked out. Mm -hmm. It would definitely be a big impact. Um, but I think you're right, the court probably is going to cabin Chevron. Um, I don't know if it will totally overrule the case, but one of the issues that arises with Chevron deference is that it kind of guts the role of federal courts a bit, because normally they're very good at interpreting statutes, or at least they should be. Um, and, you know, usually they can interpret statutes or you know, deal with the state common law issue, but when we get into these administrative law issues, 
suddenly there are a lot of scenarios where they're supposed to take a back seat. And that, you know, the theory goes, deprives, deprives a litigant of their constitutional right to have an Article III judge, uh, you know, make the ruling in this federal case that is in federal court. Uh, and so it wouldn't surprise me if what the court does here, instead of overruling Chevron entirely, is really cabinet and really emphasize that, okay, federal courts, if there is, you have to be really, 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 really <laughs> sure there is ambiguity here. Uh, you know, and then, okay, you can defer, but only if you've gone through the canons, you've gone through dictionaries, you've gone through all the various methods of statutory interpretation, um, and then you have, you know, some very complicated issue, um, then, okay, maybe you can defer then. Uh, but I think there's going to be a big focus in the court's opinion on the proper role of these Article III courts. A uh, term comes from Article III of the Constitution, which establishes the federal judiciary, and their role in adjudicating these claims uh, involving administrative agencies and the statutes that these agencies are supposed to enforce. And so I think it's going to be a very big pro-court, pro-judge, pro-Article III opinion coming from the U.S. Supreme Court. The court loves dictionaries these days. Yes. <laughs> yes. Ah, well, yes. thank you. Well, you know, I would say just pay attention to what the courts decide. Mm -hmm. We know that they'll render their opinions sometime in June. Mm -hmm. And actually, we have been very fortunate here at the Dole Institute in that we have really had five different uh, Supreme Court justices cases that were discussed here and the people mm -hmm. here predicted some did not predict and everything <laughs> else and we said watch when it comes out what mm -hmm. did you learn here what were you thinking and a lot of people said we were watching this because we were like alerted ahead of time about mm -hmm. what was going on and I think I would ask you to do the same thing and see as they are talking about these things, we're a lot more knowledgeable about what they're looking at, what they're not looking at, and where the court leans on mm -hmm. some of these issues as well. Um, so, you know, before, I have one more question, mm -hmm. and it will be your turn to ask questions. But before we do that, mm -hmm. we talked a lot about all of you being members of the Dole Institute Advisory Board. Mm -hmm. And we just have, just a simple question. Being a member of the Dole Institute Advisory Board, what impact did it have on you? I'll start with Jesse. Oh, thank you. I love this question because uh, <laughs> I love the Dole. Yes. Um, so I think when I was growing up, um, I watched a lot of cable news and I would see, you know, major figures talk make big decisions, sometimes make fools of themselves, all that great stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but from my perch, uh, just sort of in whatever little suburban setup I was in, uh, it all just felt like very remote. Like it, it felt about as real as, you know, like reading a work of fiction. Something mm -hmm. that happened in a far off place done by people that you could never aspire to be or to know. Um, it just felt quite off limits. Uh, but when I got here to the Dole Institute, you suddenly start to interact with these figures in real life, which mm -hmm. in my mind was absolutely miraculous. Like major journalists, policy makers, business people, uh, they just sort of come here to Kansas and hang out with you and <laughs> like, <laughs> talk to you. They set up in the media room over mm -hmm. there with you. They, it's, it's incredible. So these, these people that used to be about as real as, you know, like Obi-Wan Kenobi or whatever, um, suddenly show you that this is possible, it is real, it is attainable, and you could have a role in this system that previously you just thought of yourself as an observer of. You thought of it all as completely remote. Now it's made close, it's made real, mm -hmm. and it, it's inspiring. I think that sort of fundamental inspiration has lit a fire under me that has given me purpose uh, and given me more drive than otherwise I would have had. And of course, I've made some of my closest friends here as well. Mm -hmm. Just love the duel. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, I'll go. Um, so the Dole Institute has had a tremendous impact on me. Uh, my first class at KU, on my first day at KU, was in the reading room with Audrey Coleman, at the time the head archivist here, uh, now the director, and it was an honor seminar on Bob Dole. 
And that really kicked it off for me. Um, you know, I love the class. I love learning about the senator's life, his legacy. And if you're in like an honor seminar about Bob Dole, you kind of have to be involved in the SAB as well. <laughs> uh, I mean, mandatory fun, going to Partio, all that. Um, you know, it was a great time. And, you know, it kind of got me hooked. And the Dole introduced me to so many opportunities, um, you know, certainly ones on campus. I was able to work here at the Dole, which was wonderful. I met so many people, uh, many of whom, you know, have very different political views from me, very different life experiences from me. And we were all here at the Dole. Like, I can say I know people from Beloit, Kansas, from Colby, Kansas, uh, you know, from across the country. Um, from Quinter, Kansas. Quinter, Kansas. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Quinter, Kansas as well. Um, all thanks to the Dole. It brought people together who were civically minded, who wanted to make a positive impact on the communities. And that was so cool. And I want to reiterate what Jesse said about the Dole bringing some of the coolest people here, making you feel like you can do anything, because it absolutely does that. I mean, it is so amazing to think of some of the guests, you know, who I interacted with when I was here, uh, who I got help as a student worker, um, you know, like during the post-election conference in 2016, like I gave a gift bag to Bernie Sanders' press secretary, and that was really cool. Um, <laughs> I'm conservative, and that was really cool. Like, you know, this national figure in politics, to be able to interact with her, that was so cool. Um, you know, with all these national figures, it's wonderful. Um, and especially the ones who are KU alums, which I you know the Dole always loves bringing in. And I'm not talking about ourselves, like I'm talking about the people who have really made it. Um, <laughs> right? Like, if we're being honest. We're emerging, you know, emerging. Emer yeah, we're emerging. <laughs> we're emerging, but there are like so many, pe so many people who have really made it. You know, politicians, uh, you know, attorneys, reporters, you know, editors, authors. You know, it's so cool um, to be able to interact with them and know that, you know, you can take your KU degree and you can literally do anything and the Dole is showing you what your future can be. Well, Dole. then I'll jump in. They took pictures earlier, you know, before we had dinner, and they were standing in the back of those pictures, and I said, it'll be individually and then as a group, and then your pictures will be on the wall with those other people. You have arrived, you know? <laughs> and so they look at it, and, you know, they probably never thought, yeah. one of these days, you will be those people that are on the wall. That's right. And that's what an emergency a, an emergent leader is, but you earned it. No one gave it to you. You earned it. Go ahead. Barbara, you know how much the Dole Institute means to me, and it really stems back for me to a, um, and a you could call it an event, you could call it a camp uh, that Barbara puts on for mm -hmm. high school seniors called Youth Civic Leadership Institute. And it's an institute uh, a camp essentially where uh, two students from almost every high school in the state get to come and learn about civic engagement, learn about civil discourse, politics, policy, and get to meet other fellow Kansas high school seniors. And I had the great opportunity to be selected for that program and meet Barbara, uh, come, to the, come to YCLI, immediately get hooked on the Dole Institute, um, I have no doubt in my mind that is uh, certainly part of the reason why I picked KU for my undergraduate was attending YCLI, which I think is a huge testament to her ability to, along with Bill Lacey, to conceive that program and then put it on every year the way she has. But when I came to the Dole Institute, I started off as a student advisory board member, but quickly became a student employee here. And that was the greatest learning experience I've ever had in my life. I learned how to send a professional email for the first time. <laughs> I learned how to talk to people over the phone. I learned essentially just how to be a professional. And that cannot be underestimated, let alone a professional in a field that I was interested in, law, politics, policy. And that, that, that uh, uh, ability the Dole Institute has to give students the opportunity to not only be a member, but an employee is so invaluable for the professionalism of students like me. But I will certainly echo both what Adam and Jesse stated. It was just fabulous coming here every single week and seeing someone new who was just in DC arguing in before the Supreme Court, like none of us have here today. <laughs> Uh, or someone who was a press secretary, or even um, a politico themselves. Uh, I'll never forget uh, one of the great opportunities that student advisory board members have is you really do, as Jesse stated, get to 
essentially hang out, have lunch, have dinner mm -hmm. with these uh, amazing people who have accomplished so much in their lives. I'll never forget, as student advisory board coordinator, having the ability to sit next to Secretary James Baker at a lunch. He was Secretary of State under HW and White House Chief of Staff under President Reagan. And he looked at me and he said, Emily, I think this is the best chicken dinner I've ever had in my entire <laughs> life. <laughs> and I distinctly remember Bill Lacey saying, I, I'm gonna have to tell KU Catering that. <laughs> like, like, how many chicken dinners has this guy had in his life? <laughs> and I, I know that sounds so silly, but I really got to see the human side of people like that, make connections, and of course, I have a huge uh, plug for something that really developed me as a researcher and a writer is, is the archives here. Uh, Bill Lacey and Audrey Coleman helped uh, 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 get Senator, uh, Senator Elizabeth Dole's papers to be donated to the Dole Institute. And because of that, I was one of the first people uh, to, to research for my history honors thesis, uh, then Secretary Dole, Secretary of the Department of Transportation under President Reagan, get to research her papers. I was the first person looking through these papers that um, had never been touched before. Almost, you know, I was trying to separate these papers that had been stuck together since the 80s. Like this is <laughs> primary research happening. And so I think that is the absolute best thing about the Dole Institute. You have the beautiful museum. Mm -hmm. You have the archives from both Senator Bob and Elizabeth. And then you also have the programming that the students get to be so substantially a part of. This isn't come help, volunteer, do X, Y, and Z. It's no, you get to bring the goodie bag to the guest. Mm -hmm. You get to go to dinner with the guest. You get to hang out before the program with the guest. And that was so, so uh, invaluable to my uh, professional development, but it was also just pretty cool. Yeah. Like, it was yeah. cool, yeah. you know. <laughs> and if I may, I'd just like to note that the Dole does a great job of bringing in guests who are not only impressive, but also like super nice people. Um, and so they do love to talk to the students like that, you know, and, you know, really share their stories and make relationships with them. Um, like I was actually at this Constitution Day program in 2015, and the presenter was Gary Norman, who is an attorney. Um, and I was literally texting Gary the other day about this program, and I met him through the Dole, and I think that is so cool um, that you meet those people who can be in your lives for the rest of your careers, hopefully, um, and that you can also be up on the stage one day where they were and you know, try and do as good of a job as they did. And I'll do one additional plug as well. Back in 2015, when President Clinton visited, he had a little audience with the SAB mm -hmm. right beforehand. And he starts joking about his Netflix watching habits <laughs> and how he doesn't care to admit how much time he's wasted on House of Cards and all <laughs> like, <laughs> like, yeah, me and Hillary. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I'm just, like, I'm, I'm just thinking, what planet am I on right now? Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So true. All of us there with President Clinton, amazing. Um, Except me. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that was before your time. <laughs> sorry, before sorry. Time. Right. We had uh, President Obama my freshman year, and then sophomore year we had President Clinton, and then Emily got here, and mm -hmm. no, no one apparently. <laughs> sorry, we ran out of presidents, yeah. I guess. Now, look, Emily, I wouldn't take that. <laughs> <laughs> but let me just say, when I said I had a purpose for why I wanted to let you know where they were from, all right, you go from Quinter to Neodice to Overland Park, we covered a large space in Kansas. Mm -hmm. We went from small to medium to large. They all had in common the Dole Advisory Board. Mm -hmm. They all got their degrees from here, their undergraduate degrees. They all went into the law area. How often do you hear people say, how can we keep our Kansas youth in Kansas? I don't have the total answer, but I think when you make it exciting, when they know they're learning, when they know they have opportunities, and when the state continues to offer these opportunities to keep people in Kansas, that's part of it. We have before us three individuals I have one out here from the advisory board sitting right here I'm looking at, chose to stay in Kansas, and they are working in Kansas. That's not the total answer, 
But that is why I think they're very unique because there was something in this state that they found that inspired them. And they're willing to stay in this state and be the inspirers. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, I have been so excited for the last three weeks for you to hear <laughs> our own Kansas people. And that is not to reflect on all the guests we have had, the extraordinary guests. But these were our students that have chosen their careers and their giving back. And for that, we thank you very much. All right, we have two people here with their mics, and we'll take questions. We have a question in front. I, I'm Mark Johnson, and just as a, a point of personal privilege, I want to point out to those of you un, uh, here as undergraduates with the SAB, this is your future. <laughs> this is what you get from being involved at the Dole. And now I have a, a serious question. Um, Adam, you and I have never met, but I bet you I know who you were talking about from Beloit and Colby. Yeah. As, <laughs> SAB members. Yeah. Let me ask you a, a serious question, each mm -hmm. of you. Do you see a nascent center of the Supreme Court consisting of the chief and possibly Justice Kavanaugh mm -hmm. focusing on the institutional role of the court and their hope, and the chief has, has mentioned this, to maintain the court's credibility as a fully um, a, you know, operational third branch of government, and that in the truly big cases, such as the ones you've talked about mm -hmm. today, that perhaps that middle will look to maintaining the institutional status of the court and therefore not make decisions such as Dobbs, which mm -hmm whether you agree or disagree with the decision, has clearly made a, um, a radical change in, in policy which people in my generation mm -hmm. grew up with, lived with for 50 years, and suddenly it's gone. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there is a possibility that the court, at least some members of the court, are truly concerned about their, uh, their presence and that perhaps they may not be as radical as some suspect. Mm -hmm. Who wants to take it? Yeah. I mean, I can start. I think you, it's a very good observation, um, Professor Johnson, about Justice Kavanaugh. Uh, so this past term, he was actually the justice who was in the majority the most. Uh, and he also voted with Chief Justice Roberts approximately 95% of the time. So I think that's a very astute point that it appears that you know, the Chief Justice and Justice Kavanaugh are really trying to hold the center a bit. Uh, are cognizant, you know, of how the court is perceived by the public. Uh, you know, Justice Kavanaugh was equally as likely uh, to side with, you know, Justice Kagan as he was Justice Alito, which is pretty cool. Um, and certainly during his confirmation process, you would not have thought that necessarily, uh, you know, given how some people uh, perceived him at the time. So I think that, you know, that is a possibility. Of course, at the same time, as you know, it, there is Dobbs, the court really kind of, um, you know, cast away long-standing precedent, obviously a very uh, big public reaction to that. And I, I'm sure there is something else the court could do, could overrule precedent on that might have a similar reaction. Um, but realistically, you know, given Dobbs, given that Bruin is already out, you know, I think it's very unlikely um, that the court will necessarily face a position like that again. Now they might come up, um, you know, I'm cer certainly getting rid of Chevron, would be a big deal, but I don't necessarily know if it would result in the kind of backlash that, say, Dobbs caused. I would agree that there is less of a 6-3 court, particularly in, in the immediate, immediately uh, previous term, more of a 3-3-3 court emerging, I would say. Of course, the chief, Justice Kavanaugh, 
And you also see Justice Coney Barrett siding with them more and more over the court's more conservative members. Um, Justice Alito, Thomas, and Gorsuch, perhaps with the exception of Native American issues, are, are fairly doctrinaire um, in their conservative approach and more predictable, but I think that you've seen more willingness to break with that coalition um, from the three other sort of center-right or right-wing justices. Uh, so much so uh, that you know the justices in, the, in, in dissent the most this last term were not you know Justice Kagan and mm -hmm. the, the sort of less wing just it was Justice uh, Thomas and Alito. Mm -hmm. um, that might be an emerging trend, particularly uh, given how path breaking and how current shifting the Dobbs opinion was. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you bring up. Dobbs because there was a conversation within Dobbs and then also with commentators outside of Dobbs with a doctrine called, as you know, stare decisis. As you stated, uh, the prior decision to Dobbs had, had been there for five decades. Similarly with Chevron, this doctrine has been here for four decades. And if you look at the briefing on, um, on Loper Bright, the case that was uh, accepted to potentially overturn Chevron, the briefing is about stare decisis. And so it will be interesting to see going forward, does the stare decisis doctrine um, hold weight still with, it, with these justices? Is it something that they're thinking about? And in, in sh this case, this uh, Loper Bright case might be a, a good um, case for us to understand where the court stands um, in their approach to the Constitution. Uh, certainly, uh, we know that um, Justice Gorsuch is not a fan I don't believe Justice Thomas is a fan of the Chevron doctrine, and they've said so explicitly in their opinions. Um, but the chief has expressed s skepticism, and I don't know how many opinions are out there from Justice Barrett on the Chevron doctrine. I think her approach to that is a little bit more of a shot in dark for any of us to be oracles on. So it will be interesting to see how the court comes out on that. It could be, as we discussed, uh, the alternative argument, which is cabining and constraining that doctrine. Um, and so it, it certainly, as you guys pointed out, won't be as maybe emotional or controversial as Dobbs, but it could be a, t a, a test case in a way to understand where the court might stand on, on um, institutional institutional matters like keeping starry decisis, like um, like that that doctrine. And I, I would note the court is more concerned than ever about its in institutional legitimacy, particularly after the leak in Dobbs. I think that that helps explain a lot of the later cycle of mm -hmm. opinions, internal restructuring that's happened as a result of that. Uh, the institution is going to be more on the defensive than ever in the coming years, and the justices have to realize that. Other question? Yes, right there. I would be interested in knowing how all three of you feel about the roles that the rule of law and personal opinion plays in the justices, including Supreme Court justices, and them making their decisions. Um, I'll, I'll start off on that one. I think that Within each justice, they believe that they have fidelity to the rule of law, but they come at that concept from very different priors. Um, and you know, some of the justices believe that the rule of law means strict fidelity to the text or to original meanings of different provisions of the Constitution. And then some of the justices believe that fidelity to the rule of law is sort of judiciously guiding the evolution of society and the evolution of the meaning of different parts of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. If you were to like, you know, open up what's inside here and see if they believe in the rule of law, probably all nine do, and probably all nine uh, believe that's a foundational part of their jurisprudence or their judicial philosophy. Uh, but they come at it from just radically different worldviews and radically different priority sets. I would agree with that. You know, I think each justice, you know, is, you know, honestly, uh, you know, trying to decide the case to the best of their ability to get to the right answer um, and to uphold the rule of law. But it's how they get there um, that differs between them, whether it's focusing on the text, whether it's focusing on history and tradition, whether it is keeping in mind, uh, you know, societal norms as they change, as, you know, legislatures change and trying to keep up 
with them. Uh, so there are all these different paths, and together they ha generally will come together and you will get a majority opinion. Um, but I think that each individual justice and then the judges below them are trying to follow what they believe is the correct path, just based on my experience clerking and kind of being on that side of the judicial process. I couldn't have said it better than those two, so I'll <laughs> use my Chevron deference and defer to what you guys had to say. Uh -huh. yeah, reasonable <laughs> enough. Yeah. <laughs> We're not experts. Do we have other questions right in front, please? Uh, thank you all for being guests at today's program. I'd like to ask if you have any recommended reading or programming on the subject of constitutional law or government that you would like to recommend. Um, so there are a couple of books um, that are written by Chief Judge Jeffrey Sutton of the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. Uh, so although he is a federal judge, he is very big on state constitutions and state law. And I think, and he's written two great books. First, 51 Perfect Solutions, um, which focuses on state constitutions. And then Who Decides, which is about state governments and local governments and how they operate. And so it's not directly on federal law, but these books, they're generally written more toward a general audience. Um, you know, they're not law review articles or anything too scholarly. Uh, but they really do a good job of laying out, you know, that we are not just a single nation, you know, a giant mass of land. We are a nation made up of many states who have many different governance forms. And that, you know, those forms of governance are different than our national one. Um, and that the states often will inform national governments. And I think reading those books and having a good understanding of state constitutional law, state law, really helps you to understand our federal system of government and gives you a better idea of how that operates, the interaction, uh, interactions between the states and the federal courts, uh, and just federal government generally. So those are two resources that I would generally recommend. Uh, another thing that I would recommend, Emily touched on this earlier when she was talking about some of the briefing in these cases. Uh, if you are dealing with a US Supreme Court case, generally the briefing is gonna be really good at that point. So if there is an issue that you want to learn more about, whether it is Second Amendment, free speech, Chevron deference, uh, you want to go to some of the U.S. Supreme Court briefing. You can find it on the website. It's pretty easy to locate on the docket. Um, and look at that briefing. Because if the court has taken a case, there are probably expert attorneys on there who are trying to do their best to make this a simple dispute so that the justices are like, of course, that's the outcome, right? Like, right? That's the whole idea of good briefing. And so I strongly encourage you. It's not too scary. Uh, good legal writing these days is simple, straightforward. Any man on the street should be able to read it and un understand it. Anyone and the just—that's true. You know, that's Justice Thomas's um, motto. Any person on the street. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> any person on the street should be able to pick up a brief or an opinion and understand what is going on. So, if there's an issue that you want to learn more about, find the case, find the U.S. Supreme Court docket on the website, and go to some of the briefing. Uh, and if it's not straightforward enough, then it's probably not good advocacy. Um, I'm going to overshoot the mark on that one. Five books. Uh, so, <laughs> um, one is called A Matter of Interpretation. This foundational text uh, from Scalia really changed the way that a lot of lawyers read law. Um, Justice Kagan cites it as an authority. Uh, it, of course, has ideological connotations, but I think represents sort of a break in legal interpretation that's really shaped a lot of what came after. Um, two memoirs, uh, My Beloved World by Justice Sotomayor is a masterpiece and one of the books that I was reading when I was considering law school. Uh, it gives you sort of in-depth uh, details about her life and then how that shaped her jurisprudence. Justice Thomas has one like this as well, my mm -hmm. grandfather's son. Um, now my last two might be a little edgy, a little spicy. I don't know how many of you all remember Jeffrey Tubin um, mm -hmm. from CNN. He was their chief legal analyst for a little while until he what did he do? <laughs> what, did he, what did he do, Jesse? So, so he was also a columnist for The New Yorker, and this is during the earlier days of the pandemic. And apparently they were on some sort of Zoom call, like election simulation <laughs> prior to the 2020 oh, election. Oh, I know. He did not realize his camera was on, and he starts masturbating on <laughs> camera on a New Yorker work call. Like, <laughs> like unbelievable. But he's a great writer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you got to be great at something, I guess. And uh, he's written two books on the Supreme Court, both of which are becoming a little bit more dated with the years. Um, but one was called The Nine, 
uh, and does a good job at describing a lot of these foundational um, constitutional concepts and then the human drama that underlies them. Um, and then one is called the Roberts Court, which is sort of an update to that, and it goes up until about 2012, 2013, so. Um, he does a great job describing, you know, irrespective of his personal life. Well, Alec, you know, as an attorney, that it's important to have candor to the court. So I'm going to be honest with you and say, as someone who just recently graduated law school, I may not have had as much time recently to read up on books to recommend you. But I certainly will be taking a, a page out of their book and reading the books they recommended. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Seeing none, I hope you learned a lot from our emerging young leaders because they certainly had a lot to offer. That tells you they were scholars. They didn't just graduate. They retained a lot, and they certainly know how to articulate it. And we could not be prouder of your accomplishments and we are very grateful that all three of you agreed to come tonight because even though you know what you want to say and you are a scholar, it is a little different when you're in front of all of these people <laughs> and how you're being judged. And of course, people can now go to our YouTube channel and see <laughs> more about you. But I think when they do, they will be just as impressed as we were this evening. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Dr. Ballard. And thank you all very much for coming. Now, I have some extra programs for you. I don't know if you...